Welcome to this talk. It's entitled Become a Parameter Ninja. Uh, I'm James O'Neill. Those are my contact details. We were originally going to do these talks at PSConf EU in Germany, but uh, circumstances intervened and so I'm, I'm talking to you from my dining room. Um, instead of a few of uh, I have uh, this view out of my window. So here's the agenda. Um, you can see where I'm talking from. Um, you can also see I haven't had a haircut in nearly six months and I've grown a beard during lockdown. Um, some things never change. I have my trusty cup of coffee in a PS Comfy U mug and you can see uh, my dining room behind me. So this is what we're going to cover. I'm going to try and spend more time as the um, topics get more sophisticated, but I want to do a little bit of um, level setting on basics, move on to increasingly more advanced topics, going up to what I like to call ninja level. So a bit of context and being slightly flippant here, if you talk to developers, most of the value that they see in what they do is in how clever their code is. That pie chart is about 90%. Only uh, about six or eight percent is uh, ease of use and documentation quality. Well, find me a developer who cares really profoundly about documentation quality. When you look to the rest of the world, well, the first message to a developer is everybody else cares 10 times about 10 times more about documentation than you do and cares about how clever your code is only a tenth of much as much. And the difference is ease of use. Ease of use is everything to the people who actually we're writing scripts for. And getting parameters right helps both new users get into the um, function to start with and uh, it empowers experienced users to do more and cleverer things. And so this is not really on writing clever stuff inside your functions. This is on writing your functions to present the best interface to the outside world. Um, plenty of other stuff around on things to put in the middle. So some basics on names very quickly. Um, try not to reinvent the wheel with names. Use the ones that people already know. Names like path, use uh, recurse instead of using subdirectories and so on. Um, Aliases really help um, both to shorten names. So you might have multiple names that begin PA, so you can't use PA for password, but you could use PW as an alias for password and PT as an alias for pass through. And if we have any chance that the parameter name is the same as an object property, then well, the parameter is the same as an object property, keep the names the same. That particularly helps if you come to do um, uh, value from pipeline by a property value. And we'll see, see that a little bit later on. Now, one of the things that um, it annoys me when people get wrong uh, is multiple inputs. Usually you look at a command and the command's in the form of verb noun. And one of the parameters for the command is who or what is the subject of the action that I call them the target parameter. So what file are we going to copy or what service are we going to start and so on. Very rarely you have the target specified between multiple parameters. The other parameters are modifiers for that. So how are we going to do the action? Where are we going to put the file? What setting are we going to modify and so on? And the parameter that's the target, the thing that you're working on, Frequently, we want to say, do this same action to all of these ones. And so the target one should take both multiple inputs as a kind of separated list, and they should take pipeline input. Um, that's a basic test of, of good function design. Sometimes modifiers take um, uh, uh, values by uh, pipeline, by property value from the pipeline. Um, but the focus is always make sure you can pipe the Different people have different views on using types with parameters. When you write a type name in front of a parameter like this, it doesn't say this must be an integer, which is what most 
people who've come from a C or C sharp background tend to think. It means convert this into an integer. And it does help users to a small degree because it says, well, we can tell it's supposed to be an integer. We know it's going to give an error if we give it text. But sometimes when some of these casts are done, particularly with things like file types, the casts end up with stupid results. Now I'm going to show you in a minute how adding types can um, break existing code. So if you have it one way, be careful about changing it. Another thing is generally don't have Boolean parameters. You can use a, a switch parameter instead, and the switch is always in the form of specify the choice that isn't the default so that no switch does the default thing. Um, that does give some strange backwards language sometimes in the script name. If you find you've written something that says you've got to get something of a particular type because I've made you go, go and get something by ID, or you have to use for each every time the function runs, that's a sign that your um, function is not um, flexible enough about what the input is for a particular parameter. So it should accept multiples of the object here. We're having to do the for each because it can't accept multiples. And it can't accept an ID. It has to have a, a thing object. So let's have a look at the um, how this introducing types can break things. Here I've got two versions of the same function. Takes a parameter, checks to see if the parameter is uh, null. So the first one, we're just going to run it without passing it a parameter. And it says it was empty. And the second one, we've said the parameter is a string. And now it thinks there's something in the parameter. Now the reason is that when we said cast p to a string, it became an empty string. It stopped being null. And so tests have to take account of the fact that types change empty into the default empty for that type. So integers become zero, booleans become false, strings become an empty string. So you can't use a test for null. Some functions just won't work without a value in some or all of the parameters. And you've got a choice here. You can either say the parameter is mandatory, in which case the user has to fill it in and they'll get prompted if they don't provide it. The prompt is just the name of the parameter. So if the parameter name isn't self-explanatory, you need to make sure you set the help message property of the parameter as well. Or better is to supply a default. Um, there is a sort of cardinal rule, don't make the user type something if you can make a, make a sensible assumption. Now, when you put the parameter attribute in as it appears here, um, you're actually asking for a new instance of an object to be created and in inside the brackets you're saying set these properties of the object to these values so written out in full we put things like mandatory equals true now up-to-date versions of powershell the parser will uh, assume the dollar true for you if you omit it that's the parser being clever for you um, some people really prefer to include the equals true because it um, works with downloadable versions of powershell um, other people find the presence of true just grates with them. Um, but the, my, the equals true is optional. And if you have any of these declarations, there's an implied command block binding. So as soon as you put one of these in, options like verbose light up, which weren't there before. Um, if you've got parameter defaults, you really should be writing some online help. And the help should say, what the assumptions are if you don't provide the value. 
Um, one last thing that sits between basic and advanced is the use of PS bound parameters. PS bound parameters is a collection that lets you see what came from user input and got attached to a parameter. So it's different from the other variables that hold parameter values that you can access in a function body. Okay, it doesn't include um, defaults and so, and it doesn't include um, the null or empty values that are being converted to something else. So in this example, you could you, you quite frequently, and I, I frequently write like this myself, you can write if my parameter do something and it will run if my parameter effectively is a Boolean true. So anything that's not zero or an empty string or any of the others that convert to false will run the code. However, that doesn't allow me to specify a parameter with a zero value. If I want to be able to specify zero and if I want to ignore default conversions or default set parameter values, I can refer to PS bound parameters. It's not strictly a hash table, but you can treat it like a hash table. So you can refer to um, parameter with, with that syntax there. The other use for it is frequently we can use it with splatting to call another command with all the parameters that we've received. And because it's just a snapshot of those parameters, we can um, add and remove things from PS bound parameters with the add and remove um, methods. So here you can see it's got remove a parameter, but one we don't want. So moving from basic to um, intermediate level, one of the things that I, I wrote a blog post about um, late last year was called put the value in the value. Um, and to try and explain where things go wrong, I talked about switches a, a few slides back. Um, switch is saying I want a non-default parameter. So here I've got a, a basic command that says send something and send it at high priority. And that's great. And then somebody comes along and says, actually, we, we want low priority as well. And we say, OK, well, we'll have um, send thing low priority too. This should send out a warning sign because we've now got two different values for priority, but they're being set through different switches. So the value we're setting for priority is not coming from a priority parameter, it's coming from different switches for each possible value. And sometimes this gets really out of hand. Um, we'll see more on this in um, uh, when we look at EDUMs a bit later on and when we talk about parameter sets. But um, I wanted to show you a real world example. Um, I work quite closely with Adam whose code this was and he's actually incorporated some of, my, some of what I've done here into um, his release. So this is not having a, a dig at the person that wrote it. This is just using this as, a, as an example. So let's bring that up. On the left here, we have the parameter declaration from a function. Now this function um, was to find an element on a web page. And there are many ways that you can find the element. So you can find it by uh, referring to it uh, by uh, name, by ID, uh, and so on. And so the natural way to do this you might think is to say, well, okay, I'll have a parameter for each of those. And then to make sure that they, the user doesn't specify multiple ones because we can only specify one, we'll break these into different parameter sets. So we have a parameter set for each kind. And then depending on what we got passed, we can say if it was one parameter set, then call the um, the thing that actually does the work with name, name, or with ID, ID, or link text, link text. And this made me think that maybe there was an easier way of doing this. And so the uh, 
um, simplified version of, of what this was changed to looks like this. That's all of it. Um, because you can use a parameter name in this part, all those ifs have been reduced to this by statement here. So now we say, get it by one of those. And what we're going to get is that selection there. So now we've got rid of the parameter sets, we've got rid of the um, if statement or a complicated switch statement, and I did actually resort to some tricks with aliases so that the old syntax for this would still work. So actually the old parameter names became um, aliases for the this selection parameter, and we were able to detect which of the aliases was used and put that alias into by. Okay. Every time I talk about validation, which is the next part of intermediate, um, I seem to get very exercised about this middle point here. The job of validation is to stop something getting into the function that could never be right. It's not there for lazy developers to force users to do input in a particular way and avoid coding for other ways which could be right if they'd only take the trouble to handle them. And when validation fails, one of the biggest problems we get is um, very, very unclear error messages. Um, I've got an example here and it's one I've been using uh, for quite a long time now and I quite fond of putting this up in front of a room full of experts and saying, who can tell what it is that this regular expression is trying to match on? Um, it's looking for a UNC name, so double backslash something slash something else. But you'd be hard put to um, work that out just from the error message with the regular expression in it. Uh, that's not terribly helpful. So I've got a demo here of how we can uh, um, evolve the error messages that we give to users. So in the uh, editor here, I've got a function called validate and I'm going to call validate with the value 1234. Validate takes an ID parameter and you can see it's using a regular expression and this regular expression is looking for a GUID. So let's see what happens when we run this and it's the um, version 7 way of displaying the same error message that we saw on that previous slide, we just get two versions of the regex in the error message. Well, I've changed now to using a validate script, and this will throw an error if this doesn't return true. So now I'm just saying check that the parameter matches that. So let's go run the second version of the script. And now it's still not a terribly helpful error message. It tells me that a script run and, and didn't return true. So fix things to make this script return true. Well, again, not the most user friendly of things. So I'm going to modify that and say, if it does match, return true. If it doesn't match, then throw a custom error message. OK, so now I'm actually taking control of the message that comes back from my validation and said, right, tell the user something that they can actually act on. ID must be a GUID. OK, I can do something with that. Now, in version 6 and 7 of PowerShell, but not in Windows PowerShell 5, um, this is actually being promoted so that you have an error message property that you can set on the validate attribute. So I've done that there. And you'll see if I rerun validate one, I get the identical error message to when I set it in the uh, validate script. So if you're targeting PowerShell 6 and 7, but not Windows PowerShell, I strongly recommend that you start using, using some of these to give your users a bit more constructive feedback on what they should be putting in. I wanted to mention enums or enumeration types, which both validate input and um, provide the same auto completion as a, as a validate set does. Um, enums are a set of values uh, assigned as a type, and you can use them to match numbers to names. 
Um, quite often when you uh, go and fill in a per parameter and tab completion shows you a series of names, what's underpinning that is, is often an enum type, not a, not a series of strings that hold the name. So a quick demo of that, we were talking about um, the priority and not using high and low priority of switches. So now what I've done is I've defined a priority type where high is one and medium is two and so on. I've got a parameter of that type. And now when I use my function and say, okay, fill in the types, it'll tab complete one of those and it'll give me the um, value both as a name and as an integer. If I try something that's not one of those priorities, well, it just tells me what the, uh, the values are. So you can see there, specify one of the following enumerator names and right at the bottom, you've got high, medium and low. I just mentioned that um, enum types and validate sets have a common behavior. And that is if PowerShell is going to validate against a set of possible values, tab completion can suggest those values um, when you're providing your input. But you don't always want that enforcement of validation. Sometimes you just want tab to, to come up with a suggested value. So there's a contrast between it must be a single existing file name where we want completion and validation or provide a file name. So make a suggestion and let the user tab through file names, but let them provide a wildcard that doesn't match a single existing file. And so we want completion without validation. Um, Completers save a lot of time and effort because they save us typing in long things. They avoid typing errors and people generally expect pressing tab should do something useful. So it's a win all round if you if you can use them. Um, one of the places I use them is in the import Excel module that I worked on with Doug Fink. And um, one of the common ones for, or the common needs there is for colours. So I'm actually going to show you a demo of that. Here's the code that's actually used in Import Excel. It's a function and then a registration. So the function is at the top here and it takes five parameters. So the completer knows which command it's completing for, which parameter in that command, what, we're, what it's being asked to complete, and then it can see the abstract syntax tree for the line of code and the parameters that are already known. And it outputs one or more of these completion result objects. That code is then registered as a completer. So we, we tell PowerShell, register this as a completer for export Excel for a specific parameter and use the code that's in that function. So down at the bottom, you can see that now lets me cycle through all the known colors that uh, Windows knows about. Now, the logic to make this work um, is the bit between the param and the um, completion result uh, in the uh, in the function at the top. Um, so we go and get fields, we filter them down to things that match the word we've been asked to complete. And then in this case, I like to see things in alphabetical order. So we sort them into alphabetical order and then each one becomes a completion result that the tab completer can show us. Um, register argument complete has been around since PowerShell 4. Uh, in PowerShell 3, it was a downloadable option. And because we wanted to maintain backwards compatibility uh, for here, we only do the registration if register argument completer is, is on the system. So this will actually work way back down to PowerShell 3. Um, normally, you just have register argument completer without putting it in, a, in, uh, an, in an if block there. There is a little bit more to say on um, completers and we will see those uh, a bit later on. Um, but now I'm going to move on to a couple of topics that I think shade from um, basic knowledge. We've, we've really come through intermediate and now we're getting into more advanced stuff. And um, the first one of those is parameter sets. Now, parameter sets can get very complicated. And I've put slightly flippantly at the top, they are a risk to your sanity. The job of um, parameter sets is partly around tab completion again. Um, 
if you say a parameter belongs to one set and the other parameters that you've provided on the command line say we can't be using that set then tab completion won't show it and so parameter sets have this sort of pre-validation stage of preventing the user supplying impossible combinations of parameters. The difficulty with them is that we can end up with very many sets and getting PowerShell to identify the right set can get very complicated. Um, I'll also just throw out a quick warning here that if you commonly set the um, PS default parameter value so that you populate the values of one or more of your parameters, um, parameter sets behave as if you had typed that parameter in on the command line. And so um, setting defaults that way, not by setting the default values for a parameter, um, can actually cause uh, problems for parameter sets that you, you need to be prepared to work around. So with that, I have got uh, a demo with nine, I think, different little bits of code in it. So let's move on to that. Here's the first iteration of a get pizza function. Um, it doesn't do anything particularly exciting. You can see I'm being lazy in the uh, um, terminal window and letting PowerShell fill in pizza for me and it will tab complete the uh, name of the size but if I try and run it without specifying a size there's no default and it doesn't support medium so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use an enum from now on and I'm going to give the enum a default and down at the bottom of my script here I've got several different ways of calling it just to show you so I can call pizza on its own I can pipe things to get pizza I can call pizza family size so let's run that and you can see there's the result so we got a medium order a family size order and a bunch from the pipeline so now someone said okay we want switches for extra cheese and no cheese so now the output will say extra cheese and no cheese and you can see we haven't done anything to stop people specifying both so we're going to just run that one and you can see at the bottom we've got an order that's got both extra cheese and no cheese. So our chef's not going to know what to do with that order. So the, the next thing that we would say is, OK, these are in two mutually exclusive parameter sets. We have a, a set for no cheese and a set for extra cheese. And this is going to give us a couple of problems. So. Here's the first, let's have a look at the two problems. The first is that um, we can't just specify family size without naming the parameter anymore. Um, and the second is we have two versions of the function, one with extra cheese and one with no cheese, but there's not a version that doesn't specify either. So you've either got to, or you, you can't have standard cheese, you've either got to have more or none, but you can't have a normal amount. So let's go on to the next version and we'll see if we can resolve that problem. So now we can say that parameter, the um, family size pizza, um, we don't have to specify it, we don't have to name it, we can actually say specify it by a position. So we've resolved that problem, but we still haven't resolved this problem of not having um, uh, an option for neither extra or no cheese. So to fix this, um, one way is actually to say there's another parameter set. So we've said there's a parameter set that you've never actually seen and we don't describe here, but now you can assume that size is in that parameter set so if you haven't got either of the others, you can assume you're in that default one. On this version, we've actually declared all the parameter sets explicitly and not put them in that command look binding position. And now we've got uh, we've got the option back to, to make all the orders that we've done before. And if I try and do get pizza 
and say I want no cheese, it won't tab complete and suggest extra cheese for me. As you can see here, I'm trying to tab complete and find it, but it's it's not coming up. And if I actually force typing it in, it says, well, no, you can't specify extra cheese if you've already specified none. So now we're, everything's working nicely, except for one little fly in the ointment. And that is that we've broken the pipeline. Now, the pipeline breakage is a strange bit of behavior, and I've blogged about it before. We can specify a parameter on the command line, and we can deduce that if these mandatory parameters are missing, the only set that size can be in is the set name default. But when we pipe in, we lose that ability. So there's a trick that we can do and say, look for these as values coming from the pipeline. And now that fixes that problem. So that's just a useful thing to have as a as a thing in your in your back pocket if the um, if piping starts to break things. Well, now we're going to make our, our, our pizza place more sophisticated. We're going to allow people to order a vegan pizza and we're going to put up messages for the chef if, if we have vegan pizza and we're going to allow them to add pepperoni to the pizza. But you can see here we haven't done anything to stop them ordering contradictory options again. So now we've got the option for both vegan and pepperoni simultaneously. Well, we need to do the same kind of parameter set thing that we did with cheese and no cheese. But here we go. There we are. Right. Um, so now what we've had to do is we've had to declare all the possible parameters. So we've said the default is it's OK to have meat products and we want standard cheese. And then we've got meat with extra cheese, vegan with extra cheese, meat with no cheese and so on. And then all the possible vegan options. So we've got three different vegan options, two options for each of the cheeses and three options for each of the pepperonis. You can see the scope for getting this wrong. OK, and size is in all of these. Now, it's really easy when you when you're doing this to miss one out and find that you can't add size to a particular combination. So you actually have to start testing anything. So the one that we wanted to, to block, you can't specify vegan and pepperoni, but all the others. So vegan with no cheese options, vegan with a cheese option, no vegan, but a cheese option. They all work. So uh, that's uh, the uh, um, target for that. I joked about um, parameter sets being a risk to your sanity. Well, dynamic parameters are a higher level of risk. And the best advice I have is to try to avoid them. Uh, there are several reasons to try and avoid them. Um, I've been working with a module of somebody else's recently which made um, heavy use of dynamic parameters. And when you type get minus and hit the tab key, PowerShell goes and finds all the all the commands that it could be offering you and then filters them down. And when it finds all the commands, it expands any dynamic parameters that it finds. So all the um, dynamic parameters in the module were being uh, expanded and they were going off and fetching information to to expand themselves. And so there was about a 10 to 15 second delay between hitting the tab key and getting the list of commands back. So something that was fine at very small scale um, just didn't work when it scaled up to, to doing many, many parameters as this, this function was doing. It's very hard to follow dynamic parameters, partly because you don't get a nice automatic uh, dollar parameter name, you have to pick them up through PS bound parameters, but that's something you only do once. The main problem is they're not there in the param block and they're not immediately obvious when you look in the dynamic parameter block. So it gets harder to, to follow what's going on, harder to debug and so on. There are two use cases where they're unavoidable. One is to say, change the parameters that you show based on the values of parameters that have already been uh, given. And the other is to say, copy the parameters from one function to another function rather than keeping the parameters of the two in sync. And I've got a couple of examples of those to show you next. 
like the color completer example that we had before, this one comes from Import Excel and it's to set conditional formatting. You can say uh, display an icon next to the value in a cell um, based on its value and you can pick the icon from a set of three, four or five icons. Um, so we have static parameters for the range it will apply to the format and are they icons assigned going from low to high or high to low. And um, if we try and tab complete this function um, uh, just initially, you can see that it will fill in the, uh, the possible, uh, possible static parameters, but it doesn't have any dynamic parameters yet. So we've got range, conditional format and reverse, and then we go into the common parameters. There's no um, icon type selection yet. Now, when we've said uh, the when, when we've when we're given it some parameters, we can then use the dynamic parameter block to say we're going to return a parameter and the parameter is going to have some parameter attributes attached to it. So it's going to be in position two. It's going to be mandatory, and um, we're going to attach though those things to each of the following parameter declarations. So in this one. We've said we want a new parameter and its type is going to be of type three icon set. Um, this one we're going to have, we're going to create it with a four icon set type and this one's going to be with the five icon set type. So depending on what the user put in the uh, conditional formatting parameter, we'll build the icon type parameter differently. And then we put that in a dictionary and return it. So here you can see I've selected conditional format. I've said five icon set and what's the icon type going to be? And you can see if we tab complete that, we've got two lots of arrows, quarters and rating. And those are the only options we've got available. There's no traffic lights because traffic lights only have three colors. If I change this to three icon set, the parameter gets recreated. And now we've still got arrows, but we've got flags and signs and traffic lights and all sorts of other things that are available for sets of three. Now, one other just weirdness on tab completion, you'll notice that icon type doesn't tab complete. That's just an anomaly with the tab completer. It'll complete from minus, but it won't complete from minus I. A final one for this advanced section before we move on to the, the real ninja stuff is um, embedding completers. Now, we saw a completer before. Um, you can embed the completer code in the param block of the function. And I'm gonna show this in a minute, but I'd advise you not to use this method because there's a, there's a better way. The way that it works is all those things that you put ahead of the parameter in the param block. So parameter or any of the validate ones or the ones that say allow empty or allow um, null those are defining objects. That's why they've actually got the, 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 the brackets, um, the round brackets after the name. And those round brackets contain either parameters that you need to create one or property value pairs. Um, and that's the thing I was talking about before when I said the parser would assume that if you had a property name and you put and you didn't put equals true, you meant that, but really that is assigning a value to a property after the object's been created. And new object in PowerShell does something similar. It's got the creation parameters and then it's got the ability to set properties. There's a new one in PowerShell version five, or there was a new one when PowerShell five was new out. Um, and that was argument completer. So one of the things that you can put in the brackets for argument completer is a script block. And I'll show you how that looks by going back to the previous completer that we had for colors. This just gives us a nice little function called color, it takes a parameter wall color, it returns color, and in its default state, it's not doing any kind of tab completion. So if I say, give me the color parameter, tab completion just does PowerShell's default thing of filling in file names. So what I'm gonna do for this one is take the code we saw in the earlier example from Import Excel. I'm just gonna take the script block that forms that function and copy it and I'm gonna come over to color and create an argument completer attribute. And when 
that argument completer is created, I want a completion, a creation time parameter that is that script block. So we're going to create an argument completer, and as a parameter for creating the completer, we have a script block. So that's why it's in brackets like that. And now if we um, re-import the, the function and uh, run color, you can see that same code is doing what it did before, but it's doing it from code embedded in the function, not um, registered as a completer. Now, the problem that I have with this is it makes the param block quite difficult to read because I'm reading down just looking for names of parameters like color, but here where you can see me gesticulating with the mouse, um, we've got this big block of code that kind of stops me reading down the param block. So I, I don't really like this as a way of um, implementing completers. And it also results in quite a lot of duplication that we, uh, because we have to put the same code in to each function that, that uses it. So this brings us quite neatly on to the next topic. Using classes is really where um, the parameter skills could do or go up to ninja level. Some people are a little bit intimidated by using classes. They came in in PowerShell version five, so they're not really very new anymore. Um, and for reasons that you can read about online, um, they work much better if you put them straight into a PS1, PSM1 file when you create a module. Don't load them by dot sourcing into the PSM1 file or by other methods. Um, if you then load your module with using module instead of import module, um, the classes are available um, at the command line in your PowerShell session. Um, classes don't have to be written in PowerShell, they can be written in C Sharp. And if you write them in C Sharp, um, then you can take the same classes from PowerShell to compiled command that's written in C Sharp. They're not the classes that we're interested in are not very difficult to write because they follow one of um, four templates and there are um, some snippets to help you complete those templates. One of them is the completer. So we're going to segue from completer, put in the uh, param block to completer implemented as a class. Um, we've got validator and a validator basically returns cleanly or it throws just like the validator we've seen already. And we've got a new kind, which is a transformer attribute, which fixes your input and potentially might uh, might throw an error if, if the input is unfixable. Those all came in in version five. Version six has got another one for um, creating a um, value set um, on the fly. Um, we're not gonna look at those in, that one in these examples. So the first thing to do is to take that completer that we've been using already and change it from being uh, a, a script block to living in a class. I've pre-populated some things in the editor window here and what these namespaces are for will become clear in a moment. But the first thing I'm gonna do is to use one of the built-in snippets we have for PowerShell in Visual Studio Code and add a completer class. I'm gonna call that by a sensible name. So I'm gonna call my class color completer. And the namespaces let me avoid writing fully qualified um, names for the different object types. So I just had a little search and replace set up to replace those. And we've now got shorter, neater names. A class doesn't emit stuff to the pipeline. So you can see we had a, um, a collection where we were going to put the uh, results and then we return those results. So if I paste the same code in, I've just got to make a little change here and say, instead of emitting the completion result to the pipeline, add it to that completion results collection. And that's all I need to do to change my code because the parameters for the script block, for the block itself are the same. And then down in my color function, which is the same one that I had before, I'm just going to remove that script block and say, here is a type, use the uh, color completer type that I've just defined. 
and this is obviously much neater and tidier. I'm going to save this and actually give it a PSM1 extension so I can import it as a module. And uh, if I import it with the using module syntax instead of import module, um, the class in that module, because it's in the PSM1 file, I can actually get to the color completer class and say, give me a new one of those. And you can see it's got one method, which is complete argument. So now if I run color and ask for the color parameter, you can see it tab completes quite nicely. Um, this is obviously much neater code wise and doesn't have the same duplication as when I had the, the script attached to the parameter in each function's param block. Here's a different completion demo that I wrote to be a bit more creative with the completer. I've redefined CD on my machine so that it is a function and it uses this path completer. I'm not going to go into, into too much depth on what the completer does, but the main purpose of showing you this is to show that it doesn't just have to be expanding members of a set. So here I can go up more than two, more than one level with two dots. I can just keep adding dots and keep going up higher levels. Um, I can find part of my existing path um, by using star and part of the name. And I can use special symbols. So the um, circumflex accent or up arrow or whatever you call the thing that's on shift and six on most keyboards. I've said, if I use that, me, make that go to my home directory, wherever my, my profile came from. And so in this instance, we're not taking members of a set and matching everything, matching all inputs against members of that set. We're having a look for some other special cases first. And if we've just got a normal path, then we'll do the same expand as, as PowerShell normally does. But we're trapping some other special cases to get creative here. Transformers, I think, are one of the um, really useful things that very few people know about that are available for parameters. They let you take something that the user gave you, which was correct, but not in the format that you wanted it, and transform it into something more useful. So we're all familiar with seeing things like um, web forms that say a phone number can't contain spaces or dashes or brackets. Well, why not? You know, easy enough to strip them out. Um, similarly, um, I said earlier on in the talk, you shouldn't tell the user, you must give me an ID for this. Um, the user probably wants to give you a name. They don't think of their classes or whatever by GUIDs. They think of them by name. So you could do that transformation and uh, change various other shortcuts into valid paths. Um, they also give you a chance to try and fix the data. And if they if the data is just not fixable, then you can do the same throw that you've, you've seen in, in earlier uh, examples. So I've got a little demo of that. So we'll just bring that up. This follows on from the, the previous one with CD, because what happens if I don't press tab? What happens if I put in four dots or some of the other special cases that I, I put in? So now I've got a transform argument for CD that will turn those things into a proper path. So let's run that. Uh, the first one there is if I have equal signs. So this basically says I take locations up from further up the stack. Instead of using set location, uh, my CD calls uh, push location. So that's gone from two up the stack, but it hasn't actually popped things off the stack. So I've gone back to where I was two levels ago. I can use the up arrow for my profile directory. I can use the star and I can use multiple dots. So the, the same things that you saw here. And you can see there's a there's some regular expressions. The regular expressions get quite uh, complicated in some cases, but I can uh, I can uh, use that regular expression and you actually see there I have completed that one, but uh, I can use the regular expression just to say if the parameter that you've got looks like this, apply this transformation to it. 
And if I go back using the thing that I used before, you can see again, multiple dots, I can just transform into go up the right number of levels. This one brings us back to colors. Uh, and this is actually from um, a different module. Um, this one, um, the uh, API that's gonna be called at the end of the, the function where this is used, expects colors to be presented as RGB values in hex. And I've yet to meet a human who thinks in, uh, in those terms instead of as red, green, and blue. So the transform attribute here says, Basically, if we get something and it's a string, I oh, just noticed a spelling mistake there. Uh, if it's a string, not a sting, and uh, it doesn't match the, um, doesn't look like a hex number, then um, see if you can convert it into a color. Now, if you've got a color or you've just converted into a color, then convert it into a string in the right format and finally, if you've got a string and it doesn't look like the right format, then switch to using just all zeros, which is black. And finally, if someone prefixed their, uh, their string with a hash, because it was a hex number, we'll take the, the, the hash off. So now I'm going to go back to my color command and say, put in there the color transformer attribute I'm just going to reload that function and now if I do color and give it a color so let's pick a nice color um, I think we should probably do Azure here you can see it's transformed that piece of text to a hex value. So now I'm adding quite a lot of value here because I'm making sure that we get the right input um, and I'm uh, letting the user give me that input in a way that makes sense. Um, this incidentally is where it was needed. This is the, the REST API that said we had to supply that in a bit of JSON as a um, hex value. The last of the three ninja uh, class types are the validators and the validator simply returns if everything is okay and it throws an error if it isn't. Um, validators can do some quite sophisticated stuff but what they struggle with a little bit is looking at other parameters on the command line. Um, in the completer, we've seen there's this fake bound parameters parameter that uh, gives you access to all the other parameters on the command line. Uh, you don't have that for uh, a validator. Um, you can go and find the parameters that have already been bound before validating this one. Um, but that means you can only look at parameters before you are on the command line. So we'll have a look at uh, a real one of those. This um, one picks up from uh, the previous demo where we were looking at things in Azure DevOps. And um, Azure DevOps defines a number of processes which are the, our working methodologies like Agile and Scrum and it has basic and so on. Um, and you can define your own processes descended from those. So I've defined, I've got Scrum 2, 4 and 5 here. And what I want to do with this validator is make sure somebody selects a process that's from that list that you can see below. So I'm just going to start populating this um, uh, validator here. Um, we very rarely touch engine intrinsics. The bit that we're interested in is arguments. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to get a list of uh, processes from a cache that we maintain. And if what we're given isn't in, the, in that list of cached processes, then we're going to throw the same exception that we've been throwing elsewhere and tell the user what a valid result would look like. Now, if we run the validation and we haven't been given a, um, a process, we don't want that to throw. So we're going to leave it to 
other parameter attributes to decide whether we can be null or empty. And you can see here, we can validate it and we can say, get the work items. So bugs and tasks and features and so on that are in one process type. But if we use an invalid name, we don't make the call to the server. We just come back and say, uh, sorry, you've got Scrum 4 and Scrum 5, but Scrum 6 isn't a valid name. Now, in the, those, those templates, those um, work item types, um, when we go to uh, get to validate work item types, we might need to say, and what process template are we using? And this is the syntax that we have to use to find that. We can't use PS bound parameters because PS bound parameters is the, par are the parameters bound to this method in this class. Um, but we can refer to the commandlet that called us and then to its invocation and its bound parameters. So if we need to look at the process template a bit further down the line, we can use it with that syntax. So that was the problem I was referring to on the, the slide leading into this demo. And this slide means we've reached the end. Let me just summarize what I've covered in the last 50 minutes, 55 minutes. Basic stuff, match user expectations. So getting the right names, accepting the input that users want to give you. Save the user work. So fill in defaults and use completers and transformers so that they don't have to type everything and they can type what they expect to type rather than what you want to work on. And getting the input correct. Parameter sets are a help if you can structure things accordingly. Dynamic parameters for those couple of cases that I described. And use validation, yes, definitely use it, but be smart about it. Make sure that the message that comes back from validation says, uh, this is what you have to do to make input correct. Um, if you catch yourself using validation to save, save work rather than prevent errors, then you now know what you should do. And I hope I've shown you the whole ninja level part of this was to show that much more is possible with classes. You can use PowerShell by default or there's an option for C Sharp. Normally, at this point, I'd be looking up at a big audience and saying, thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for staying. If you've listened and stayed this long, thank you, whoever you are. <laughs> <laughs>